Hi, everyone. Welcome again to our author interview segment. Today, we're interviewing author Kevin Clark, and he is from St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. He's lived in Alberta and Nova Scotia. And here's the kicker. He's now retired and living in southern Spain. Well, isn't that just a nice dream? He has four children and a granddaughter in his blended family. He has traveled extensively throughout North America and Europe and is partial to warm weather, as I think many of us are. <laughs> He's having spent many years working outside of the outside in the harsh Alberta winters. And yes, they are harsh. I've been there. <laughs> Kevin prefers his new life on foot rather than by car and spending time with his wife and their young dog, socializing with friends. I'm assuming that's human friends, but, you know, could be dog friends mm -hmm. too. and spending time on the beach. He recently formed a locals writer group with his friend, Mark Bertrand. And Mark has also been interviewed on this show um, and is in the arduous process of learning to speak Spanish. A collection of stories from his time as a rental property owner are contained in his memoir, So You Want to Be a Landlord, A. I love the Canadian piece in there. This is on Amazon, so please go ahead and buy it, read it, and leave a review. He's in the editing process of his next novel, tentatively titled A Shaken Raven, which he hopes to complete in 2023. And of course, when that's done, we'll be back talking to Kevin about that book and whether he kept the title or not. So Kevin never once in his life thought he'd be a writer. So this is proof positive of the unexpected, some might say bizarre effect a nine-week pandemic lockdown can have on a person. So Kevin, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Christina. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. So I think first thing we're going to do, I'm just going to, we're going to talk about um, your book. And uh, so I'm going to read the blurb. It's called A Towering Trumpeter. I'll share uh, what it's about, and then we can get into talking about it. So I'm going to just read the blurb right now. It is, on a lyrical journey satirizing the rise and fall of an American iconoclast, the story follows Amos Moses, unlikely rise to fame and fortune in his desperate search, search for adoration. Framed around an upside-down version of the book of Exodus, the tale of childhood, abandonment, salvation, love, betrayal, and assassination is propelled by American popular music, culture, and celebrity. In his quest for adulation, idolation, after enduring a tumultuous and humiliating early life, Amos Moses finds himself leading his base of adoring right-wing fans in a battle against the oppressive tax and social policies of his former foster mother, Carmelita, the president of the Great Union of Territories. With his three pillars of support, his best friend, his crafty older brother, and his devil-like father, and the considerable power of his record store brand, the towering trumpets behind him, Amos risks it all for worldwide glorification or potential ignominy, can we say the word ignominy, sorry about that, in his run for presidency. All right, so let's talk about the book. Okay. <laughs> so it's a political satire. So there's many scenes that are totally absurd. And I was inspired by, in a way, by Timothy Finley's uh, novel, Not Wanted on the Voyage, which was the Noah's Ark and all around that. So given the absurdity of the election of 2020, I just felt I needed to say something. Uh, because everyone was taking Trump so seriously after what they'd been through. Right. So what it is, is it's not historical in the sense that all the elements of Trump's life from birth right through to the, the election, and even the election, he's not against Biden. It's I've changed it all around. But anyway, uh, it's a fun tale, but it follows the, book, uh, the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. So Moses is abandoned he's adopted so but it's an upside down version so moses in the book of exodus exodus is um adopted by let's say a right-wing tyrant pharaoh right dictator uh amos is adopted by uh, a left-wing socialist lawyer carmelita and her husband moby and carmelita 
goes on to become president of the great union of territories. So it's got all the same elements as the book of Exodus. There's abandonment, adoption. Moses becomes the leader and he's the most unlikely of leaders. He has a lisp. He doesn't want to be, but differently, Amos in the role of Trump wants glorification and adoration because he was so physically weird, strange hair, wandering eyes. He had a lisp. So he wanted to prove to everybody that what his value was. So that's his path. And the path Moses took to free his people was, um, that was his path, free them from slavery and get away from Pharaoh. Well, Amos wanted to, he did all the same things. He had to escape. Um, he became famous. He, he got his brand. His father, he got in, his estranged father, he got in touch with, uh, who became the devil like God. So Amos comes across these things in his life, looking for adoration, and he experiences the burning bush with his father, sending him messages to do these things. Uh, when he goes to uh, escape in the Exodus, he comes across the Mississippi River and he parts the river goes wandering in the desert, finds his father on Mount Sinusitis. His father gives him instructions to bring the tribe over. Anyway, it's, it, it's, it's all the same elements. He builds an altar, which Moses, God told Moses to do. But uh, when he builds his altar in the true American spirit, he commercializes it. So it's like a, a small version of a dome stadium. Right. And it's got NBA booths, NHL booths, Christian Dior, the whole thing. It's like a big mall. <laughs> and he becomes nationally famous. So that gives him the power to what, what's driving him in his quest for the presidency is to get rid of the taxes that the socialist, his former mother or former foster mother, uh, she's taxing him to death for his social policies. So he runs for the presidency based on his fame. And then it all goes into a wild election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's pretty crazy. Okay. So yeah. it sounds like there's lots of character motivation, character flaws, conflict all the way through it. How would yeah. you describe the genre that's it, it's in? It sounds like it's kind of a bit funny too. It's it's humor, uh, political humor, political satire. Okay, right. There's there's about forty uh, songs from the '60s up to the, with lyrics that are reworked to fit the scene. Oh, how fun! So, yeah, it's it, and there, there's only like a verse or two, or a verse and a chorus, just sure. to you know connect, because his best friend is Albus in a role of Elvis. Nice. So Elvis has many songs he sings. At, they all do at times. So sure. it might be a musical. You know, it, it, it's a lot of fun. But um, the the characters are are pretty bizarre. Amos's mother's death is just don't give <laughs> away. Don't give no, away. No, no, no. I won't. <laughs> so it sounds like you've spent a lot of time on character names and thinking them up. No, they just, that's funny. They just came to me because um, the, the reason I put uh, Abe, I, I took a lot of stuff out of American culture, like Bugs Bunny. You know, I mean, there was a lot. Of, like, so I took Abe a, a Capocus. I mean, Bugs Bunny or one of the Looney Tunes did a thing that named stuff. So I said, oh, it would be Abe Capocus. But it worked out that Amos and Abe are brothers. Right. So, so his father's an alcoholic, and he thought it was funny that his his two children were AA. <laughs> but is but along the way, his father owns a record, some record stores in a place called Tango C. I don't want to get into too much because I know we don't have a lot of time. But that's okay. Um, what happens is uh, Amos is Amos is kind of unaware of what's happening, but his father's dealing drugs in the back of the stores. His older brother Abe wants to deal hard drugs and his father's getting worried about what what he's doing so his father has him killed in a very bizarre accident that's well, a bad, bad father bad father bad father 
But um, the aid comes back years later uh, he, into Amos's backyard as a reincarnated, wait for it, talking opossum. <laughs> okay. And he's Amos's most trusted advisor. So it's pretty out there. <laughs> nice. Okay. So how long after you finished um, A Towering Trumpeter did you start uh, Shake and Raven? Actually, I, I wrote that at first. I wrote, I actually wrote The Raven um, in the lockdown. Oh, okay. So it took me two, right, two right, and a right. half months. Yeah. And then what happened was the election and Trump, it started getting so bizarre that he looked like he was going to win. I said, I got to write something about this. It's just yeah, it's, well, it's super you know, timely. Really. It's, uh, you yeah. know, it's, it's a super timely story that, um, okay, so then The Shaken Raven and A Towering Trumpeter are not related stories. They're both standalone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, the, the Shaken Raven is, a, yeah. And and can you just give a quick summary of what that one's about and, and the genre? Okay, it's a, a two-family, three-generational saga uh, set in Oregon. And a wealthy guy, he loves nature growing up in it all the time camping and building bivouacs and everything and uh when he grows up and takes over the family business which is forestry and fishing he gets misdirected and starts decimating the forests and the oceans gets in a dispute with a a clinket from uh southern alaska a clinket woodcarver she builds him a totem pole he he shortchanges her then um uh, she ends up moving to where he's at from because she got married. But anyway, there's the dispute there. Sure. That's the first generation. It ends in a cataclysmic event, event and the Clinket one is gone. But her son is there and marries another Clinket woman. And the dispute is, you know, starts again between this guy, Paul, the protagonist, and this other one. So that dispute goes along and Paul is starting to change a little bit. Right. And then there's a big event. So it's three books, really. The first one, the first conflict, second book with the daughter-in-law. The third one, I don't want to reveal it, but it's it blows it all apart. Like, sure. It's, okay, it's, so yeah. it sounds like a totally different genre. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a drama. I don't even know what you call it. Like I'm, I'm new to this, so yeah. I'm not sure. It's a, yeah, it's a real, it's 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 an environmental statement in a way. Okay. okay. Like I mean, I'm 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 writing something. I wrote. I mean, the the memoir was just fun, and but I, there are some things to say in there about that whole situation, sure. you know. And the trumpeter, I had something to say, and and the raven one there's a message about the environment the way people behave but it comes down to a personal a social issue more than the environment right Right. yeah well good on you on doing different genres because it's it's hard to do that and and stay in voice and so i'm interested to read the different the different ones and see (laughs) see what happens to your author voice on a serious book and a a more humorous book well it's it's in fictionary now so i'm going to start that probably in a couple of weeks to run it through the editing nice perfect so yeah let's talk about fictionary just a little bit so you're a storyteller uh editor You've you've done your book in there. I'd love to know what was the most significant change you made to your novel because of storyteller advice. Okay, POV, which I've never <laughs> heard of before. <laughs> it was all oh, yeah. It was an epiphany, really. It okay. was like because I tried to stay too true to the the biblical story, mm-hmm. with even though it was upside down. Amos was following the same trajectory as, as Moses. Yeah. But Moses' goal was to free his people. But I realized Trump's goal was never to free anybody. He wanted adoration. So I changed a lot because he had a new goal. Okay. So it, it, but a third of the way through Fictionary, it was like, it was so hard <laughs> not being new to editing. I like, you know, it was really mm-hmm. difficult, but I saw it getting better and better. Nice. And one night I thought, it's like a flower that you don't know what it is opening up. 
Oh, that's what it's supposed to be. You look inside and you go, there it is. So it did that. It, it was unbelievable to me. The yeah. other thing was, yeah, the other thing was the, um, just the, the, the characters, um, I guess, I'm sorry, just going to look at my notes. Uh, That's okay. Yeah. Right. It, <laughs> you did a thing on one of your, one of your tutorials, The Born Identity. I, I looked at it and said, I'm like the third born identity in this book. I write the I'm third born in the family. So I, I write like no conflict. No, no, no. Right. There were multiple opportunities for conflict in this story. And I just kind of made them go away, mm -hmm. you know. So I went back in there and got people fighting. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, it really brought that out. It's and and that's great to hear because often I, I don't like conflict at all in my real life, but I love it in a book. Yeah. So, and, and I think <laughs> when people first start writing too, there is a tendency to 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 kind of dampen down the conflict because you think, oh yeah. But that's what really people are reading for. And so it's got to be there. there. So that's, that's and I know I do. And I, I just thought I'm putting my voice in there, but that's not what people want to hear. And they don't have to be fist fights and really yeah. bad, but they, they need to be some tension and conflict. So that helped a lot. Terrific. That's, I mean, I'd love to hear that, of course, because Fictionary is there to help people learn how to write and how to edit and how to make their story better. So it's always you know, fabulous. Kind of now I'm really happy with, I'll look forward to the Raven book with the editing because I know what it can do for a story. Nice. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that yeah. too is lovely to hear. So, you know, it's kind of interesting because you wrote, it's different because you wrote Raven first. Mm. And then the trumpeteer, and and so now you're a book that you wrote quite a while ago. You're pulling in and using everything yeah. you learned to edit the second novel to go back and do the first. So that's an unusual circumstance that m most authors I'm talking have done one, and then they go to the yeah. next. Well, right? trumpeter was trumpeter was topical. You know, it was topical. Yeah. It was hot at the time, and I didn't realize how long it would be to edit and the whole thing. So. Um, I finally have it out, but it's still topical because he's not going away. <laughs> no, and you know, it, it's editing is hard. It just is. There's mm. no way around it. It's a very hard task to do and we all yeah. have to do it. But yeah. Yeah. So after you finish, what, what was the first thing you do you did after your final export in, in Storyteller? Uh, well, when I brought it over back into Word, it was just a little bit of formatting, but okay. um not much, but I, I sent it to four beta readers on a service that's online. And they sit around the table and take turns reading chapters to each other. So when I got that back, it was really positive, which I, because Fictionary made it uh, cohesive. It, it, it was in almost like it was in parts, like the chapters, they, they didn't quite flow. So they were, but they had some things to work on um nothing critical but one of them was a secondary voice which is when something happens or something somebody says something i didn't quite bring out how the other person reacted that's okay. involved yeah um and i cut scenes off short like i just finished them they needed a little bit of filling in so i did that i went uh took it to uh microsoft word and did the spell check and the grammar and mm -hmm. the punctuation um, after that, I did the line and copy edits, and then, uh, let's see, I did the formatting, and I did a read aloud on the computer. Good for you. So then I printed it off and did a mark, my final markup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Year and a half working on this, and there's like an error to every page. I know. <laughs> like a I comma know. or a oh but anyway so that's kind of what happened out of that so terrific yeah. so yeah. now that you've you've um got these books do you have a third book or fourth i guess is your fourth book now do you have a fourth i got an idea for one it, you know and i don't really care if it's marketable it's just a friend of mine's got a a wicked story that he's a one of the first vietnam refugees that came to canada oh wow and, 
Yeah, he was in the South Vietnamese army and just ripped me apart. <laughs> so I'd like to write it. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah, he so told me the would, story. Would you do there. that as a narrative nonfiction? Or would you make a would you make a full out novel? Um no, I think I'd make it a novel. Yeah. It'd be it'd be a fiction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I change characters and yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. My yeah. very final question, which is really important to me, mm. what type of dog do you have? Oh, a young dog. He's a he's a mix between a, a Chihuahua oh. and over here here they have a, a well, not quite. We thought he might be, but he's a mix between that and a, they call it a Bodeguero. It's a a breed, a kind of a breed of a terrier that they they crossbred down here in Spain for. Okay. Uh, catching rats in the in the wine cellars so he's got long legs and trim body but he's got the chihuahua face <laughs> oh nice nice okay you gotta I email go me any, a picture i yeah i go i go in town and uh, well we're living town i go a couple blocks up for a cop people are stopping me all the time well you know for him <laughs> yeah yeah which is great i love that about a dog people do talk to you when you have a dog it seems more normal yeah. than talking to a person by themselves seems a bit odd where i always yeah. have a dog with me so people talk to me and i love it <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> terrific yeah. okay so tell people how they can reach you and where they can buy your books okay the book is, right now it's on kindle for a five-day trial a free free promotion until sunday night Okay. And then after that, it'll just go on sale. I'm I'm prepping the the text or whatever you do to put it on for a novel or paperback on June 19th. Okay. So I want to do some promo in between to try and generate a little interest for them. And that'll be on Amazon Kindle. Nice. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. And of course, with this video, I'll put the buy links below it. Um, right. So people can get to the books and when you read, not you as new, but when people watching read this book, please leave mm -hmm. a review because it's so important to writers to have reviews. You don't have to say much, just a little bit um, to help a fellow writer out. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Loved hearing your story today. Super interesting. And um, I look forward to seeing more of what you do. And thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>